Can you guys hear? Oh, <laughs> now you can. Good morning and welcome to Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church of Pasadena. My name is Ellen Rosenblatt and I am a member of your board of trustees. Um, we are prioritizing uh, perf in <laughs> imperfection, no. connection over perfection. I'm so sorry, I forgot I was doing these welcome words until five minutes ago, so this is a bit of an improvisation. Uh, welcome to all friends, members, and guests. We create and grow an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. We acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielina Tongva peoples, the traditional caretakers of the land and waters of this campus. Today's service is led by our interim minister, Reverend Dr. Teresa Cooley, music by music director Zaneda Robles, and our inimitable NUU Choir. Woo. Um, based on guidance from our COVID committee, um, wearing or not wearing a mask is now up to every individual. Please respect the decisions of others. And we still have a uh, mask required section over there. Um, families with young children are welcome uh, in the sanctuary or the narthex. Are we still doing that? Children's program is now in the um, beginning yeah. in the chapel, and children are welcome to stay here or go directly there before the service. Um, we're not having them in and then going out as we do during the year. Um, after service today, we have two things of note. One is a queer family picnic in the picnic area outside, and the other is a discussion of, of general assembly business in the living room. Um, our order of service and more extensive announcements are now available as a link in the Sunday email or posted in the narthex or through the QR code at the back of your hymnal. You can always get more information on these and other activities at the welcome table. Again, welcome to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are and wherever you are on your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service.
This is the kind of day that definitely needs warming up. Let's rise and greet one another as you're willing and able and say good morning. It is lovely to see old friends and new. Great to see you all. We look with uncertainty beyond the old choices for clear-cut answers to a softer, more permeable aliveness which is every moment at the brink of death. For something new is being born in us if we but let it. We stand at a new doorway awaiting that which comes, daring to be human creatures, vulnerable to the beauty of existence, learning to love. Come, let us worship together. Our opening hymn is number 1029 in your teal hymnal or on the screens above. Number 1029, please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing our opening hymn, Love Knocks and Waits for Us to Hear. spiritual practice through which we put our values into action. Each Sunday, our congregation dedicates 100% of its contributions to a local social justice organization or activity. 
In addition to the plate, online giving is available through the QR code on the donations box just outside the sanctuary or using the text instructions shown on the screen. If you wish to make a payment towards your pledge or contribute to church operations, make a note in the subject line or use an envelope available at the donation box. This week's our gifts go to the Laurel Foundation and here to talk more to us about that is Elias Naraho. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Elias. I use he, him pronouns, and I am the outreach coordinator at the fam and family relations at the Laurel Foundation. I want to express my gratitude for giving me the opportunity to be here with you all today again. For those that were here last weekend, I shared with you what we do, but today I want to dive deeper into why we do it. There's an urgent need for safety within the transgender community. At the Laurel Foundation, we provide this safety and inclusion by affirming youth's gender identity and expression. Just imagine the immense impact we have when we take these young individuals to camp and do so with no cost to their families. Our mission is to give the next generation an opportunity to be seen and heard. In a world that often seems riddled with hostility towards those who are different from us, it is essential we fight this hatred through understanding and compassion. It is often fear and ignorance that drives us to hate, and we firmly believe that by offering a platform for education and acceptance, we can have a more inclusive society. In 2022, our camp theme for the year was a whole new world. I'll read you an excerpt from that yearbook. Co-dreaming of a new world can start by building together. Our wish was for campers to imagine a world where they could be the most authentic, magical, and safe. A new world starts with dreaming, it starts with community, it starts with you. So whether you belong to the transgender community, LGBTQ+, or consider yourself an ally, we need you to dream with us and to support our mission so that camp remains accessible and free for those who desperately need it. Camp Mulberry stands alone as the only free camp for transgender youth nationwide. Its existence is transformative. Lives are changed at camp, and the positive effects extend far beyond the duration of summer. I ask you to join to make a difference, to dream with us, and to build with us. So please consider supporting the Laurel Foundation as we continue to change lives at Camp Mulberry, and so on. Thank you. Will the plate carriers please come forward? Thank you so much for your generosity today. I wanted to share that today's music is special. Um, first, for our opening offertory, um, we want to offer this music, including this piece, as a kind of a preview of the work we've been doing in preparation for our concert, which is happening this coming Thursday. We had a beautiful flyer that we failed to print. <laughs> so, <laughs> CJ made a gorgeous flyer. We failed to print it. So I have to continue, I have to tell you about it. So please just remember or write it down. And today we're offering a music in celebration of our love and thanks for this wonderful place. The first piece we're singing today is A Quiet Stream by our very own John Kimball.
Thank you, John, and choir. Please join me in the spirit of prayer, of meditation, reflection. Let us ground our bodies and open our spirits. As I share in these words from the poet and activist, Adrian Marie Brown. Moon, teach me. Teach me how to wear the scars without masking, how to be all the time darkness and light, how to follow, to be satisfied with reflection, how to be careful with the tides, graceful but crafting storms, to be the one who gives, who is held in orbit, Moon, teach me how to love the sun. Please, please tell me, teach me how to be seams and pockmarks and beautiful, to be a portal of longing and connection, to take a month to open and to close again. Because I am not perfect. I surrender to the light every time if it's a flash, I sit dazzled in the darkness. I don't even know how to wane. Moon, teach me to fill up with ritual, to be so powerful and so very small. Amen. You will recognize the text for this next setting. It's a new setting, and this is the premiere performance of Eight Principles.
to have a composer in the house. <laughs> two, two, two or more, or more. Another one, yes. People often say that a minister pretty, has, pretty much has one sermon in them. <laughs> Meaning that no matter the particular subjects that we address, we're really saying the same thing over and over and over again. <laughs> just with different examples. If this is true, I feel sorry for the congregation who has to hear it over and over again. I don't totally subscribe to that theory, but nevertheless, when I look back on what I have been thinking and preaching about in my 33 years of ministry, there are some common themes. I can't say I've looked terribly far back. Actually, I've lost all of my sermons from the first 10 years of my ministry. In the multitude of my moves, papers got thrown away, technology changed. I can't say I'm disappointed at the loss. I'm sure that I would cringe at some of these earliest attempts, but I do venture to say that I probably addressed many of the same themes then that I do now. I've had to conduct this retrospective recently because of once more entering into the search process, having to choose which sermons I would put up on my website that would make a congregation want to hire me. It can be a humbling process, much as if you have to stare in the mirror too long and only see your flaws. So I actually ended up farming out much of the job to Deanne Morris. Is Deanne here this morning? No, she's not here. Who often asked me for, yes, there you are. (laughs) 
So Deanne often asks me for copies of my sermons, and so she graci graciously took up the task of rereading and telling me the ones that she thought were most worthy. I'm glad to say I mostly agreed with her. <laughs> All of this is to say that Deanne totally deserved every bit of carrot cake that I sent her way. <laughs> I recently came across a new book by three Yale Divinity School professors, Miroslav Volf, Matthew Krosman, and Ryan McNally Lentz, called Life Worth Living, A Guide to What Matters Most. At last, I thought, someone gives us a map, <laughs> a guide to life. And it is an excellent book full of really thoughtful questions designed to ask us to reflect on what meaning our lives might have and what meaning our lives may still have. I highly recommend it. And while I was reading it, I became aware that much of what they talk about, I have been preaching about these many years. Not that I have the solutions or the guidebook myself, but at least I think I've been asking some of the same questions. In fact, the book revolves around the question with a capital Q. The question, they say, is about worth, value, good and bad and evil, meaning, purpose, final aims and ends, beauty, truth, justice, what we owe to one another, what the world is, who we are, how we live it, it is about the success of our lives or our failures. A very grand and noble set of questions indeed. But here's the catch. They don't answer the question. <laughs> and when I look back at the questions I have been pondering over my career, I realize I don't provide the answers either. Sorry to disappoint you. If I did, my hubris would need to be examined. But what I think I have provided is some grist for the mill of your own questioning, some reflections I've engaged in that have been helpful to me, some resources I've drawn upon that have supported my questioning, all in the hope that you may be asking many of the same questions. So there are two questions that seem to be preeminent in the sermons that I have offered. One revolves around how we might come to terms with the inevitable fact that we don't have complete control of our lives. To accept that we may not have all the answers, no matter how much will and effort we might expend, our lives can still fall apart. So the question is, how do we deal with that reality? The other is the age-old question of how we can find hope in the midst of despair. When all seems to be falling apart, is there anything that we can hold on to? As I said, just like the book about a life worth living, I don't have definitive answers, but I have found it helpful to myself to review some of the resources that I've drawn upon in these questions. And the two I want to hold up today are not great philosophers or theologians. Instead, they're people who, like me, return to the same questions over and over again. For the first question about the ultimate limitations that are the reality of our lives, I can find no greater philosopher than Kate Bowler. Kate wrote two really excellent books. The first, Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved, <laughs> and No Cure for Being Human and Other Truths I Need to Hear. If you are struggling with a sudden devastation in your life, I highly recommend that you turn to Kate. She also has an excellent podcast in which she invites others to tell their stories as well. I've talked about her before. She's a professor of Christian history at Duke University who at the age of 35 suddenly discovered that she had stage four colon cancer. 
At the time, she had a three-year-old boy, a loving marriage, a fulfilling career, and she felt like she was watching all of this crumble in front of her. Her first book was written after having survived beyond one year. The doctors gave her a 17% chance to do so. And having no idea how much time she had left. Her second book was <clears throat> after she was declared, amazingly, cancer-free. And then not knowing how to live the rest of her life with the clear realization that she still has no idea how long she has. Ironically, her academic work has been to explore what is known as the prosperity gospel, or the conviction that if you just pray hard enough or believe in God enough, all of your ills will be cured and you will be successful beyond measure. She takes apart these assumptions one by one and makes it clear how harmful they can be when people inevitably realize that faith is simply no guarantee of health or success. She tells a story about how after her first major surgery, when she was finally able to get up out of bed and walk, she went downstairs in her robe and slippers to the bookstore in the hospital. And she began to take all of the self-help books off the shelves. <laughs> and throw them on the floor <laughs> and tell the bookstore manager, the clerk had disappeared by then, <laughs> that she shouldn't ever put those up again. Unfortunately, she did not listen. Recently, she's turned to looking at our self-help culture, which offers us a cure for whatever ails us at every turn, either by eating right or thinking the right thoughts or any of the other myriad solutions that are offered to us. She says American culture has popular theories about how to build a perfect life. You could have it all if you just learn how to conquer your limits. There is infinity lurking somewhere at the bottom of your inbox or in the stack of self-help books on the bedside table. It taunts you as you grip the steering wheel in traffic, attempting your new breathing practice. Or in the pre-dawn minutes, when you know you should be working out. But she says, the truth is somewhere inside of me. There is no formula. We live and we are loved and we are gone. Tumors budded and spread across my colon and liver without my consent and here I am. I feel a spark of horror each time I remember it. We come undone. This happens to all of us. We fall ill, we get old, we can't have that baby or keep that relationship. We missed our chance to go to this school or to take that job. Our parents die before we know them and our kids forget our love. We lose people before we can learn to live without them. Kate Bowler is unrelenting in this message and in how she thinks about her precarious life. She realizes over and over again that embracing the reality of our limitations is the only option we really have. She says all of our masterpieces, ridiculous. All of our striving, unnecessary. All of our work, unfinished, unfinishable. We do too much, never enough and are done before we've even started, and it is better this way. Toward the end of her second book, she tells the story of visiting the Grand Canyon, something that was on her bucket list that she was thrilled that she was finally able to do. And on the way there, she discovered a tiny chapel just off the road in the middle of nowhere. So she decided to go in, and this is how she tells the story. I found a miniature sanctuary, unheated and inelegant. The floor was loose gravel. Someone had nailed together some benches to face a chunk of stone serving as the altar. But the light of the setting sun, an incandescent orange, 
poured through the windows and lit up the walls, which were covered with graffiti, both fresh and faded. I ran my fingers along the black ink covering the altar and the pen marks gouging the soft wooden walls, and almost every inch of it was covered with words like these. I miss you every day. Please let my daughter be the way she was before. Did you make it to heaven, my love? Helen, I am weak, but you already knew that. I looked up and hundreds of slips of paper were stuffed into the rafters and the seams in the wall. All these people who have fallen into the cracks in the universe, undone by the smallest tragedies, we try to outsmart our limitations and our bad luck, but here we are shouting the truth into the abyss. There is no cure for being human. And yet when she decides to add a slip of paper to the rest, she writes in Latin, dum spiri spiro, which means while I breathe, I hope. Which brings me to the other question I seem to revolve around and around and search for some clues. How can we find hope when all seems hopeless? I've turned to countless resources on this topic, but most recently I found some help in Shankar Vedantam's podcast series, The Hidden Brain. I've been listening to lots of podcasts. It's amazing the things that we find in there. And in two recent episodes, he talks about optimism and hope. In one, he turns to a financial analyst named Morgan Housel, whose most famous book is called The Psychology of Money. He reflects on things like helpful ways to approach the stock market, but underneath these practical ideas are some profound notions about optimism. He and Vedantam talk about how pessimists are often the people that we believe we think they're the ones telling the truth. And optimists seem like hucksters trying to sell us something. There are basic genetic reasons why we are hardwired to pay more attention to the negative than the positive. Constantly looking for danger means we have a greater chance for survival. But attending to the bad only or obsessively only leads to hopelessness and despair. They talk about the realization that bad things happen in an instant, but good things take time to develop and always involve a more complex story, so they are harder to see. Housel says, there are no overnight miracles, but lots of overnight tragedies. When we're faced with terrible things, it seems naive at best and cruel at worst to try to focus on good things in the midst of tragedy. It can feel like we're denying the suffering of others or ourselves, but not to do so leads to paralysis. Why get out of the bed in the morning when everything is falling apart? But if you look at things in a more complex way, over a period of time, you can see that the good things are not the opposite of the bad. The good things are found intertwined among the bad and often motivated by them. We're far more innovative when we're forced to face difficulties. Housel himself calls, calls himself a short-term pessimist and a long-term optimist. He says, when we take a much longer view and look up from the day-to-day -day disasters, we can find hope that the good will eventually override the bad. In another episode, Vedantam talks with a psychologist, Jennifer Chevens, who studies how people find hope. She tells story after story about how people find hope even in the midst of failure, not because they receive a lightning bolt from afar or because they force themselves to concentrate on the positive, 
but it can come when we take the longer view of our lives, remembering times we did succeed or overcome loss, or by focusing on small goals that help us step by step emerge into a brighter future. To me, these are not just psychological concerns. They are deeply theological. I turn and again and again to the quote from the great Václav Havel who said, hope is a dimension of the soul. It's not essentially dependent on some particular observation of the world or an estimate of the situation. Hope is not prognostication. It is an orientation of the heart. It transcends the world that is immediately experienced and is anchored somewhere beyond its horizons. Hope, he says, in this deep and powerful sense is not the same as joy that things are going well or willingness to invest in enterprises that are obviously headed for early success, but rather an ability to work for something because it is good, not just because it stands a chance to succeed. Havel wrote these words when he was interred in a Soviet prison camp, not sure whether he would ever be released. So he's not a light and easy optimist. I love that idea of hope being a state of being in the world, an orientation of the heart, of the spirit. Living this kind of life is not easy but it helps us rise from the ever-threatening pit of hopelessness. These questions about hope in the midst of despair and finding the courage to face our inevitable limitations circle around some similar ideas that we cannot control ourselves into a perfect state of being or avoid suffering through achievement or make things good and bright always there is no simple recipe for happiness or hopefulness, but one realization puts us on a path toward them, and that is that we are not alone. And this brings me to the other theme that I seem to preach over and over again. We need one another. We need one another for comfort, we need one another for challenge. We need one another to remember that our story is not the most important one or the only one. We come together not as a collection of perfect people, but as a people who are flawed and who are trying, who are grieving and who are finding hope. This is what community is for. Finding one another as company in the struggle, celebrating the good with us and mourning with us when it is bad. There is no single road to happiness, but there is a path that emerges when we step out onto it together. As Kate Bowler says, there is no cure for being human, but being human together makes it more than just bearable, it makes life worth living. So may it be. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 128 in your gray hymnals. Will you please rise in body or in spirit and please join us in singing our closing hymn number 128 for all that is our life.
When everything feels too big, focus in. Look for what is small enough that you can call it by name, milkweed, sparrow, soul. Trust that you can walk in fields without understanding how they came to be, but feel yourself moving in them. Notice what is near you, not in its lack, but in its completeness. Learn to see again. Learn to receive again. Amen.